Hello and welcome to a masterclass in Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. I'm joined by my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Robert Festigi, uh, as we continue to try to unpack on a graduate uh, or doctoral type of letter uh, level, uh, symposium fashion of, of the great pearls regarding Our Lady, uh, both in terms of truth and in terms of love. And we want this particular lecture uh, symposium discussion to focus as kind of a segue between uh, Our Lady and Scripture, which we've done in our previous sessions, uh, to ultimately Our Lady in Dogma, but as an interim uh, presentation to discuss uh, Our Lady very briefly in the early church and also to speak about the nature uh, of Marian devotion as treated by St. Thomas. Uh, unfortunately, it's just too restrictive to try to do an entire uh, series uh, on the history of Mariology, which would be massive in and of itself. But but the goal of, of, of this particular segment is to connect the scriptural references uh, through the fathers and at least a little uh, essence of Mary's uh, understanding of devotion, the, the level in which the medieval church examines her and, and as so uh, wonderfully articulated by St. Thomas Aquinas. So, Robert, let's begin, if we can, with, since we've just left Our Lady in the New Testament in previous sessions, let's begin with a authentically Catholic understanding of Our Lady in the Apocrypha. So maybe for our listeners and viewers, you could kind of define what Apocrypha means and then uh, what Catholics do and do not believe as found uh, regarding Our Lady in the Apocryphal writings. The, the, thank you very much. Well, the, the word Apocrypha refers to non-canonical writings of the early Christian centuries. And um, <clears throat> it comes from a word meaning hidden or secret. And there are some Apocryphal writings which are way off. They're coming from a a Gnostic dualist uh, point of view. And St. Irenaeus in the second century highly criticizes these. Then there are other um, apocryphal writings which reveal concerns of early Christians. And so they, they, they kind of blend together legend uh, with, with uh, devotion. And so we, we have uh, sometimes legends of the saints, but what these apocryphal writings about Mary reveal is a great interest in her life, what happened to her after she uh, uh, departed from this earth and so on. So it shows a great interest. I'll just read to you what uh, Father Luigi Gambro uh, states, that the apocryphal writings cannot be considered a witness to the official teaching of the church but they at least serve to give a certain idea of the religious interests and Marian piety of their time and of the questions that the faithful asked about the Lord's mother. And so we have some of these, like the Odes of Solomon date from the late first or early second century. And they testify that Mary gave birth without pain. So very early on, this was, this was the awareness and then, of course, there's the proto-gospel or proto-evangelium of James, which uh, re refers to Joachim and Anne as the parents of Mary, and that Mary, uh, St. Anne conceiving Mary was somewhat miraculous. So it shows a great interest. And then it, it, it was trying to explain the brothers and sisters uh, referred to in scripture of, of our Lord. And so we don't accept this, but some people, in, especially in Eastern Christianity, accept this, that Joseph was an elderly widower. Mm -hmm. And so he had children of his own, but he was the one selected. And there's also testimony in rather graphic detail, as we know, of Mary giving birth without losing her physical sign of virginity. So this is from about the middle of the second century, but it shows how in the early church, these were great concerns. And then we also, I could mention these transitus stories. Mm -hmm. Some of these date from the 200s, probably the third century. Uh, and they continue into the sixth century. Uh, and they relate stories of Mary's 
passage from this world to the next. They all agree that Mary's body is placed in a tomb, which is later found to be empty. And so there's, there's a great interest in what happened to her, uh, that she was taken up to heaven. So this is early testified in these, these transitus stories. And, and, and Mark, maybe you could mention something about witness to Mary and devotion in the catacombs. Certainly. And, and, and before we leave the, the apocryphal writings, I, I think it's very important, and we've talked about this before, uh, that we make this distinction, that the church does not derive from apocryphal writings as its source anything that we hold as part of our doctrinal truths or our liturgical truths. Rather, we see in apocryphal writings the manifestations of the oral lived tradition that was part of the apostolic church. Now, that's a key difference because otherwise we're saying, well, yes, part of what we believe are from legendary writings or writings that we ourselves say are not biblical writings. Uh, and so it's critical to say we don't get the names of Anne and Joachim from the Proto-Evangelium of James, but the reality and the existing living tradition, which has and possesses the fact that Anne and Joachim are the parents of Mary, that's also reflected in apocryphal writings. And then it reflects things that are not accurate, like the idea that Joseph is a widower, that the church has never embraced that. It was, uh, I think, rather unfortunate that uh, St. John Chrysostom kind of latched on to that, and that, I think that gave life in the Eastern Church to this idea, but they, they've never sanctioned it either. Um, but of course, these are testimonies, and as you say with Father Gambro uh, appropriately uh, stating, to the interest of Our Lady from the beginning. Uh, as part of the living tradition of the church and uh, the, the realities that are conveyed in, in, in these testimonies are, uh, are wonderful manifestations of what is believed by the faithful. And also some of the things of Joseph being anywhere from 80 to 120 to 180 uh, in some of these apocryphal writings, obviously, again, a well-intentioned effort to protect uh, Mary's virginity, but it's using uh, age rather than virtue to the loss of St. Joseph. So now, yeah, in, so in reference to, we're seeing uh, even uh, what, what is estimated in terms of Our Lady in the Catacombs now, anywhere from the end of the first century to the first half of the second century, uh, several rather important images, uh, some would even include it uh, to the second century into the third century, Images of Our Lady in the catacombs. Now, why that? Why is that significant? Because the catacombs were the sacred places of the early Christians. I think there's been a lot of uh, deconstructionist writings of saying, "Well, no, Christians never hid in the catacombs." Well, in fact, they did hide in the catacombs, uh, and there was true persecution. And so, when they decorated the catacombs, it was done with the, with the deepest of reverence, and that's why you have images of uh, Our Lady in the catacombs. For example. Um, you know, one of uh, the most significant, I think, is in, in the catacombs of St. Agnes, uh, where Our Lady has her arms outstretched, and in one arm is St. Peter, and the other arm is St. Paul. Well, that's really Our Lady as mother of the apostolic church. Peter and Paul always stand for the church, the fact that Our Lady would be in the middle of them. Um, also, where they had images, you know, they'd have... Uh, images of Our Lady on gravestones, which would indicate, indicate her intercessory power. They would have images of Our Lady over the uh, nave of, in which they would celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and she'd be at the top of that almost as a protectress. Um, and so these are all real testimonies to the early church's understanding of the centrality of Our Lady, especially after the ascension of our Lord Jesus. Exactly. It's, it's amazing. And and then we see in the early apostolic authors, saints, ref, uh, theological development and also great uh, Marian devotion testified by very uh, early prayers, like the, what we call the subtuum presidium, which uh, goes back at least to the fourth century, but maybe the third. Mm -hmm. But this shows how the 
intercessory power of Mary was recognized very early on. If I may, may I read this uh, prayer? Please do. Please yeah, do, Robert. Uh, yes, and this is, it's called Subtuum Presidium in Latin because it, it begins with, uh, we under thy patronage we fly. You know? But this is a, a, a standard translation. We fly to your patronage, O Holy Mother of God. Despise not our petitions in our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers, O glorious and blessed Virgin. Oh, they, they, this, so we see Mother of God, she's the Virgin, and she delivers us from all dangers, her great intercessory power. So a number of doctrines, uh, uh, really dogmas about Mary, are expressed in this very early prayer. Yeah, it's very true, Robert. And and some would put it around 250 AD, uh, even in the middle of the third century, depending on, on historical author. But what does it tell us? It tells us that at a time of persecutions, the early church went to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly point out, she's referred to as the Theotokos, you know, over 200 years-ish uh, before Ephesus, before this is declared. And it also is a great point that a dogma is a doctrine before it becomes a dogma, right? It's a truth that the church teaches before it's solemnly proclaimed because it's in, this, in the source of revelation. Uh, and, and secondly, it talks about the early church's intercessory power, uh, excuse me, uh, the early church's uh, belief in Our Lady's intercessory power. I, I couldn't help but think, when, Robert, when I, when I, with reference to the subtomb, how we have third century Christians who trust in Our Lady's intercession but we have 21st century Christians who don't. That's a regress. That's oh. not a proper development of doctrine. That's not a hermeneutics of continuity. Uh, and so the idea, you know, I was talking with, with uh, one friend uh, recently, and he was talking, you know, in, in, in polite debate with a Protestant Christian saying, do you think that it really took us 15 centuries to get everything right, that we really needed, uh, you know, an interjection of Martin Luther in the 16th century. So for the first 15 centuries, we were so wrong about the Eucharist, about Mary and about the Holy Father. Uh, but, but here we have 21st century Christians hesitant to call upon Mary, because I think they don't see this as a tapping of intercession. They see it as a form of, of idolatry. Uh, and, and and they don't distinguish between prayer to a member of the mystical body, which is what the early church is doing, a mother of the mystical body, as Augustine will confirm, uh, versus adoration. And we'll talk about those distinctions a little bit later. Yes, exactly, exactly. But I mean, it it, it reveals, it, 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 it's almost like it's honoring Mary with great devotion, O glorious and blessed virgin. So this is recognizing she's glorious, she's blessed, she's a virgin. And, and this, is, this is third century. If she had other children, then why are you calling her virgin? Yeah, right. And, you know, as C.S. Lewis quipped, you know, when you have a toothache, uh, there's only two people that really exist in the world, yourself and the dentist, the one who can remove it. And so the early Christians under serious persecution, we know the persecutions of Diocletian and others, they went to the mother. And that's a testimony to their level of belief in Our Lady's powerful intercession back in the third century. Well, let's also anchor uh, the first major theological image of Our Lady, uh, Robert, in, in, a, in a model that still can testify to essentially containing Every major dogma and doctrine, at least implicitly, contained in it, and that's Our Lady as the new Eve. So let's go to Justin and Irenaeus uh, for the articulation of this, this, this massive contribution to understanding who the mother is, and they have it, uh, as many believe, even from the apostolic age. Exactly. Mary is the new woman, but she's also recognized by these early church fathers as the new Eve. And St. Justin Martyr is, dies around 165 AD, but this is what he writes. The Son of God became man through a virgin, so that the disobedience caused by the serpent might be destroyed in the same way it had begun. 
For Eve, who was virgin and undefiled, gave birth to disobedience and death after listening to the serpent's words. But the Virgin Mary conceived faith and joy. For when the angel Gabriel brought her the glad tidings that the, the Holy Spirit would come upon her and that the power of the Most High would overshadow her so that the Holy One born of her would be the Son of God, she answered, let it be done to me according to your word. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, recognizing the parallelism between the first Eve who was disobedient and the new Eve who was obedient. And this is uh, uh, even more uh, uh, maybe significantly uh, uh, expressed through St. Irenaeus of uh, Lyon, who died around 202, but he's writing around the year... Um, well, uh, probably 180 AD, mm -hmm. and this is actually quoted in Vatican II, Lumen Gentium uh, 56. And here it's, it's this, um, uh, uh, it's not just simply um, a reference to her being the mother of God and the new Eve, but also it, it very much supports uh, what we would call um, co-redemption. Sure. Oh, and, and so that that, that uh, I'll just read to you uh, uh, part of this, you know, first Adam, he says, had to be recapitulated in Christ. So death might be swallowed up in immortality and Eve had to be recapitulated in Mary so that the virgin, having become another virgin's advocate, might just destroy and abolish one virgin's disobedience by the obedience of another. And then even though Adam, that even though Eve had Adam for a husband, she was still a virgin. By disobeying, she became the cause of death for herself and for the whole race. In the same way, Mary, though she also had a husband, was still a virgin. And by obeying, she became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What Eve bound through her unbelief, Mary loosed by her faith. That, that, that's a stunning, uh, you know, Mariological on steroids single line. That Mary was the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. I would dare say, Robert, of... Of 10 one-liners in the history of Mariology, this is clearly uh, of the 10. It might be clearly of the top five as well. So let's not pass lightly over this. And why does the council, what, what's the context of Lumen Gentium 56 when they quote this? The context is saying Mary was not simply passively engaged. She was actively cooperating in the salvation of humanity. Well, that's straight up co-redemption. Uh, and even if they're talking about the uh, incarnation by way of emphasis, the incarnation is the redemption anticipated and begun, as the fathers tell us. And so here you have in the second century, and they estimate his writings against the heres against you know uh, against heresies somewhere between 180 to 185. AD. But this is being taught on, on three continents, Robert, at the same time. That's why many historians believe that this was part of the apostolic tradition passed on from John to Polycarp to Irenaeus, uh, that Mary is the new Eve. Regardless of its immediate history, this is saying that a human being, a woman, a new Eve, is paralleled antithetically with the old Eve, so you've got the same themes. You've got Adam, Eve, a tree, and you've got disobedience. And so we've got the new Adam, the new Eve, the new tree of the cross, and Mary's obedience. But, but key of it all is that Mary actively participates in the greatest action of human history, which is the redemption. Um, and I also love that, that specification. Uh, that Irenaeus includes is uh, saying that she's the cause for herself and the whole human race. So it, that begs the question, well, we know Mary's 
part of the human race and Irenaeus knows she's part of the human race. Why that for herself? Is, is this not some seed fashion of Mary's unique mode of salvation, even perhaps her immaculate conception that uh, has Irenaeus specify her, you know, yeah. salvation for herself and the whole human race. Exactly, exactly. And, and when we uh, talk about the uh, title co-redemptrix, it's interesting that Father Gabriele Roschini, the founder of the Marianum in Rome, in his book, Who is Mary? Uh, one of the questions is, what does it mean to say Mary is the co-redemptrix of the human race? And he says it means that just as Eve cooperated with Adam in our ruin, Mary cooperated with Christ in our reparation or our redemption. That's what it means. I remember you, you, you said you once spoke with Cardinal Schönborn and you asked him, when did the uh, belief in Mary in co-redemption uh, begin? And he said the second century. But it might even go back earlier than that. But maybe you could report on what what the cardinal said. Yeah, that that was his reference, and that's why you know when he, when I asked him to do an article for us on co redemptrix, he sent um, a homily he gave, but he extended it on the fact that Mary deserves the title co redemptrix just in virtue of her yes at the Annunciation. But this but this further goes with with co redemption. Uh, and a unique human role. I mean, Robert, there's so much we can say about this, and I, I just want to uh, compliment the fathers for their strong, unanimous defense of a woman's active cooperation in the redemption. That's nothing more than what the title co-redemptrix ultimately means. Uh, surely there could be specifications of exactly her role at Calvary, and we grant that, but but that's what we're talking about here. And they got it from the second century. Um, I remember talking uh, with Father Laurentin at the 2000 uh, Jubilee for uh, for the Pontifical Marian Academy. We we're having lunch together. And, you know, we, we had a longstanding kind of duel regarding the co-redemptrix. Uh, and he was not at all in favor of this definition. And right in the middle of his vegetables, he, he oftentimes he only eat vegetables. Uh, he was a, he, he was very uh, slight. And as he was eating his vegetables with a little olive oil on them, I said, well, Father, surely, surely in Irenaeus, you see this causality. He said, yeah, well, but they don't use the term. But, you know, Robert, I find that objection to be so odd for a scholar. Well, they don't use the term transubstantiation either. They don't use the term trinity. I mean, that term's not in scripture. Uh, the, word, the, the word Bible is not in the Bible. I mean, and I, quite frankly, to, to dovetail, I found it to be one of the arguably worst, dare I say, um, theological comments that was uh, reported by uh, Cardinal Ratzinger saying something similar, that the co redemptrix title, you know, isn't a biblical title. Well, there's so much of what we hold that are not ex specifically biblical titles, but this all is, the truth is there with Irenaeus from the beginning. Exactly. And I would I would go back uh, to the young Father Laurentin, who in 1951 published an article later turned into a little book about the title Co-Redemptrix. And because it had been sanctioned by Pius X, and now we know also Leo XIII, and also used by Pius XI, he said it would be gravely temerious for anyone to dispute its uh, legitimacy. And that's, he, he's the same man writing in 1951. And then in the year 2000, 50, almost 50 years later, he reverses himself. But I, I think the young Father Laurentin had it right in 1951. Right. And, and it's and it's reminiscent of what we talked about before in that Crenotanda, where uh, the theologians who took the title out of the first schema uh, said uh, the title, absolutely true in itself. But right. which could be mis which could be misunderstood by our separated brethren, that is Protestants. Well, uh, let us pray and hope that the church never uses that as our theological method, 
uh, for removing things that might be misunderstood by our Protestant brethren, things like the Eucharist, things like the papacy and infallibility, uh, let alone uh, things of Our Lady. But it, it's there from the beginning, from the apostolic era. And that's what's so powerful uh, and, and so great that Vatican II quotes Irenaeus so specifically defend active role, because that active role is also going to manifest, all, manifest itself clearly at Calvary as well. Exactly, exactly. And as we've talked about, Lumen Gentium 58 shows an active involvement in Mary in uniting her sufferings to those of her, of, of her beloved son, our Lord, and also offering him you know, surrendering her maternal rights, but offering, uh, consenting to the immolation of the son she brought forth. Right. So this is something active. If you consent, you're active. It's not something passive. No, no, no that's exactly true. And, you know, as we're going through this this segue from scripture to, to the specific dogmas, of course, there's other great gems. We have, you know, the Council of Ephesus in 431, the definition of Our Lady as the Theotokos, the God-bearer. We have the whole development of Mary's and testimony, um, it's unanimous testimony to Mary's perpetual virginity, uh, as well as the dogma, as we'll talk about in 649 by Martin I, her threefold virginity, uh, virginal before, during, and after the birth of Christ. And then, of course, the extraordinary uh, medieval uh, explosion of devotion to Our Lady. But I say explosion, Robert, not because, uh, not in terms of a, a lacking of the foundations before the Middle Ages. This was a beautiful development, almost like a, an embryo in the womb of the church of the truth about Our Lady. It, it moves on. It, it's, it's present in the apostolic church. It moves on gradually. It, it, it grows and, and, and matures. Uh, and then, you know, walk into any medieval basilica or cathedral and you see the, you know, huge image of Our Lady uh, as the mediatrix uh, and the, you know, popes and saints and mystics and religious under her, almost like little children of the, um, under the mother. But all of that presupposes an accurate concept of devotion. So, we're going to hit devotion briefly here, not because devotion is more important than dogma, because dogma is more important. Ultimately, we, we love based on the truth, but that it's critically important that we see that the medievals had their devotion in order, and it's uh, defined and articulated and categorized as so. So if we can, uh, let's go to, to the angelic doctor, St. Thomas in Terrace Park. Uh, question 25, uh, Article 5, where he talks about these great categories, which, quite frankly, are not his to originate. I mean, it was, it's really John Dam Damascene talks about these in the 8th century, but but Thomas, as always, gives such clarity to these categories of Latria, Dulia, and, and Hyperdulia, and how those relate to Our Lady. Yes, and also in the second part of the second part, in uh, Question 84 and Question 103, he, he teaches pretty much the same. But here, the, the, the distinction between latria, which is the worship due to God alone, and dulia, uh, which is veneration, respect. And I, I sometimes think of uh, that last of the divine praises after benediction. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. And so, in, in other words, uh, the angels and the saints are worthy of honor because they reflect God and God's bounty and God's grace mm -hmm. and his living in them. And so I know he does refer uh, in responding to one of the uh, objections about the title hyperdulia given to Mary. But he said this is because she's worthy of the highest veneration possible. I think sometimes we get mixed up with the word worship. If you go back into older English, the word worship had a broader uh, application. And so even in Ontario, there's still a tradition of calling a judge your worship. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that could be very confusing. But the, the <laughs> distinction that St. Thomas makes, and, it, it, and, and it, it's already there in St. John of uh, Damascene, it's there in the Second Council of Nicaea, 787, is between the worship due to God alone, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also, we can worship the sacred humanity of Christ. That's why we can worship his sacred heart, as was affirmed by Pius VI, and then again by Pius XII, that because of the hypostatic union, his heart is part of his sacred humanity, which is united to his divine person. So we worship, even as the Second Council of Constantinople said in, in 553, we don't have a separate worship for his humanity and a separate worship for his divinity. We worship both with the same act of worship because yeah. he's, he's, he's human and divine. But, right, but, right. but we would we wouldn't have a type of Nestorian worship on our side where we're splitting them and, and happen. But no, uh, really, it, it is, you know, rightfully said the secunda secunde, that, that second part of the second part, question 103, articles three and four, where he really, and the other references, he he goes into those with, with application, but that's really your latria dulia hyperdulia reference. And you know, with latria, um, he specifies this is the worship. Due to God alone, we would use the word adoration predominantly for this. And St. Thomas says, well, why does God deserve our adoration? The, the worship proper to an uncreated being. And Thomas answers, uh, because of his absolute lordship. That's because right. Of his dominion. He is the creator of all. And that's why God alone, God alone deserves the latria, which is, again, a species of the category worship. So uh, as you point out well, Robert, there's confusion about that word worship, but the word worship uh, is comparable to the word devotion. It's a, it's a generic reference. Yeah. It includes worship of God, worship of the saints, worship of the angels. Now today we tend to avoid the word worship for the hyperdulia and dulia categories that with, of the saints and angels. Uh, we use the word devotion, that's fine, but you can't call the earlier church or the medieval church in error because they use that term more generically. So Latria is that species of worship due to God alone in virtue of his absolute lordship. And that's very strongly distinguished from Dulia, which uh, comes from the word dule, you know, the, the word for slave, you know, servitude. Right. That's right. So, and, and, yes, and, and you know, the, the word adoratio, you know, a, adoration had a broader meaning. I remember reading Suarez writing in the late uh, 16th century, and he makes a distinction between adoratio latriae, yeah. the adoration of the worship due to God alone, and adoratio dulie, which today we would be better to use veneration, veneration. And I, I remember uh, reviewing the English translation of Father Hauke's excellent book, Introduction to Mariology. And even though he's German, he wrote it in Italian because he was teaching an Italian speaking Lugano in Switzerland. But he says the word worship cultus in its generic meaning refers to honor directed to a person because of his or her excellence in Religious realm, it refers to the reverence expressed towards God and to the creatures united with him. So first of all, worship is owed to God as Lord and end of every creature. We speak of adoration, uh, of uh, lutrotic lut worship, cultus latriae. The Greek word latriae refers to service of God. Honor directed to the saints is motivated by their union with God. Such veneration is called Dulia, cultus dulie, uh, refers to service or slavery in general. So you you know that's where the the word dulos means slave or servant. So we 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 express honor to those uh, who to to whom we owe service or veneration. Right, and and who would be in that category? Well, all creatures that serve God in excellence that that manifested a created excellence uh which is what we call holiness so that's the angels and the saints uh and again thomas uh, rightfully says it is very legitimate to honor created excellence uh, quite frankly robert we do it all the time we have olympic gold medals and we have 
keys to the city. So we don't have a problem with, we have academic awards. We have Nobel Peace Prizes. Well, that's all honoring created excellence. But for those who had a created excellence in relation to God uh, in the order of holiness, they deserve our veneration. And that's the, the general category of dulia. Um, and now Our Lady, uh, and there's a laundry list of reasons, but there's a couple of predominant reasons why uh, hyperdulia, which I uh, kid with the student sounds like a thyroid condition, but it's really this proper level of devotion exclusive to Mary for three fundamental reasons. So why does Mary uh, receive what is a form of devotion, which differs not only in degree, but but Thomas is like nature. It differs in nature and degree than dulia. Um, and that's because of her theotokos, by being the mother of God, by her immaculate conception, and by her perfect obedience to the will of God, as, as Trent teaches. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on the hyperdulia category. Yes, it's the highest veneration we could give to a creature. And this is this is found in, in a fabulous Deus, the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception. But in the beginning of that, uh, blessed Pius IX says, Mary was uh, filled with such an abundance of the gifts of the heavenly bounty, far more than any creature. So that's why she could be called the queen of the angels. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and then he, he more or less adapts um, Anselm's point, God is that then which doth, nothing greater can be thought, and that he adapts Mary as uh, the, the creature, that, that then which none greater can be thought. Yeah, you yeah. can't even imagine, next to God, we couldn't conceive of a more perfect creature, because yeah, yeah. she is the, the living ark who brings God to creation. So that this is, it. but I, if I may read just a little bit from St. Thomas, this is the Please. second part of the second part, question 103, and you summarize this beautifully before, and he says, for God has absolute and para, paramount lordship over every, over the creature wholly and singly, which is entirely subject to his power, whereas man partakes of a certain likeness to the divine lordship, for inasmuch as he exercises a particular power uh, over some man or creature, wherefore dulia, which pays due service to a human lord, uh, is a distinct virtue from latria, which pays service to the lordship of God. And, and, and we would say, you know, uh, Mary is called domina, which means lady, but it is the, it's the feminine of dominus or lord, you know, and, 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 and so we, we, she's also called, uh, you have Kyrios, and she's also called by, by Greek fathers, Kyria, you know, the, she's the lady, she's right. the Madonna, and, and so even more so than any lord, she's the lady, and even more than kings and monarchs and, and presidents, she deserves the highest veneration possible uh, of human beings towards a creature. Right. And when we think about what it means to be the mother of God, to actually have the second person of the Trinity inside you and to give the word flesh. And then when we think about how the saints, and again, Aristotle's right, the more you can emphasize the difference of things, the more clearly you have the distinctions in your mind about them. So if we think of the great saints, like you know Padre Pio and the little flower and St. Maximilian, the apostle, St. Paul, Peter, etc. But then we contrast that with she who gives birth to the Redeemer. She who doesn't just excel in grace as the saints do, but she who has a plenitude, a fullness of grace from the moment of her conception. And uh, as this manifests itself, she who never even committed venial sin. Uh, now, uh, I don't take us for Jansenists, Robert, uh, but venial sin is not that difficult to commit. Any impatience, any judgmental thought, any sin against charity. But to go her 60-some years on earth, even after they crucify her innocent son, and to never exercise an uncharitable thought or judgmental thought, that's something beyond what any other human could do. And that's why that specification that it's not just more dulia, 
it's different in nature and degree than that devotion we have to the saints. That's why St. Bernard's right, De Maria Numquam Sadis, enough cannot be said. Unless, if you want to be uh, theologically careful, unless you're talking about Latria. Of course, that's too much. But yeah. that's not a, that's not too much love of the mother. I just want to address that too, Robert, because you can't love the mother too much. Our love of our Blessed Mother will never equal the love of Jesus Christ for his mother. So people like the Coloridians, uh, the early church sect that gave Latria to Mary, and most of them were believe themselves to be women priests, that's not too much love. That's a disorder. That's a falsification of truth upon which then error of the heart or devotion come. That's very different. That's radically different than saying, oh, I think I love her. I love Our Lady too much. You can't love Our Lady too much, but you can have errors about her. And that's what happened with the Coloridians. Exactly, exactly. And as, as St. Louis de Montfort puts it so beautifully in true devotion to Mary, God had no absolute need of Mary just as he had no absolute need to create. And compared to, 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 to God, Mary's less than an atom. In fact, she's like nothing because she's a creature. But God chose to accomplish his greatest works through her. And this was predestined. Ab eterno, as, as Lumen Gentium 61 says, and this is why, why many like uh, Venerable Maria of Agreda say this is what led to the rebellion of the angels. Uh, uh, some of them, when they saw that God was going to become, this was part of his plan to become incarnate, and that she would have, uh, she would be, have, be superior to them. So out of jealousy and envy, they rebelled. And that rebellion continues. That's why demons hate the name of Mary, because she's a creature, but yet she has, you know, uh, 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 control over them. You know, she did something that they could never do. To be, to, to be the mother of the word incarnate. You know, Robert, I've had uh, several exorcists tell me, and one was the, the uh, principal exorcist in Rome, um, that when the name of Mary is brought up during exorcism, uh, the demons tend to flee. Uh, in fact, uh, there was one reference by an American exorcist, uh, Monsignor Rossetti, in, in the D.C. area, where he believed he was exorcising both Beelzebul and Satan himself from this poor soul. And at mention that Our Lady was coming, Beelzebul left on his own uh, because he didn't want to face the mother. He didn't want to have the humiliation of having to be sent away. But the, the exorcist in Rome had mentioned, um, and, and one of the corollary commentaries, that during an exorcism, that one of the demons confessed to the priest, who, by the way, is always in charge of the exorcism. This is not like Hollywood exorcisms where the priest is flying out the window because of the power of Satan. No, the priest has the power in the name of Jesus Christ. But the demon revealed, he said, you fools, if you only understood the power of the name co-redemptrix, you would be invoking Our Lady by that name. You'd be invoking her, didn't call her Our Lady. You'd be invoking her by that title all the time. So this is that dynamism of recognizing the true, unique, hyperdulia level of love based on the truth of who the mother is. Is she human? Yes, forever she will be human. Is she a new creation? Yes, she is that too. Exactly. And I think in the Magnificat, there's that one line, God who is, who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And Mary uh, is she's the masterpiece of god and yeah, yeah. and 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 she has a kind of omnipotence through grace this is what uh, blessed uh, saint john uh, john paul ii said referring to blessed bartolo longo's uh, yeah. uh, 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 phrase omnipotent through grace but it's always through grace and so she's great because God chose her and God chose to accomplish such great works through her. But she's not just a passive instrument. She's active. She's a mother. A mother is active. And, and so she gives her consent in the name of all human uh, nature to be the mother of the word incarnate. This is at the very center of salvation history. How could we forget about Mary? You're absolutely right, Robert. And let's end on this note since you bring this up. 
Uh, I just want to go to Secunda Secunde question. So the second part of the second part of the Summa, question 82, article 2, where St. Thomas says that devotion one has to God's saints does not terminate in them, but reaches to God through his saints. So let's just think about that uh, for a second, that those who excelled in love of God co-naturally, essentially reflect God because the whole reason they're saints is because they excelled in love of God. So, you know, uh, imagine a room of, of artists and let's say they have an artwork, uh, at least one artwork next to them, okay? And then you're walking around and you say, oh, I love that piece of art. I think that's beautiful. And then the artist says, well, thank you. But then you respond, uh, well, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the artwork. And then the artist humbly says, yes, but I am the creator of that. And you say, I don't care. Well, that would be irrational, right? Because if you praise the masterpiece, you're praising the creator of the masterpiece necessarily. And so as you say, well, the mother is the masterpiece of God. When you praise the mother, when you give her the hyperdulia she deserves, that glory always redounds back to God. Uh, and that's why, you know, St. Maximilian and, and, you know, many of the saints who have said, to honor Mary is to glorify God. Now, you have to make your distinctions, but it's not possible to honor the masterpiece and not to honor the master while you're honoring the masterpiece. Exactly. And in, in a fabulous Deus, what, proclaiming the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, these are the words of blessed Pius IX. And God honored her, Mary, above all creatures with such love that in her alone, he was pleased with the most singular benevolence. And then, and then he con continues, therefore, he wonderfully filled her far more than all the angels and saints with an abundance of all the heavenly gifts taken from the treasury of his divinity. In this way, she being always and absolutely free from every stain of sin, completely beautiful and perfect, would possess such a plenitude of innocence and sanctity that under God, none greater could be known and apart from God, no mind could ever succeed in comprehending. <laughs> These are the words of a Pope <laughs> proclaiming a dogma. That This is what we believe about Mary. That's right. That's the mother. Well, that's excellent. Well, that's, a, that's a perfect quote to end our treatment on. Again, um, talking about Our Lady in the Patristics, talking about authentic medieval distinctions and authentic uh, corresponding levels of love uh, of Our Lady. So it's not just a, a type of hyperbolic pietism of why Our Lady deserves a love beyond all the saints or all the angels. This is theologically grounded and it's something that really pleases our Lord. So, well, thank you, Robert, for this, uh, again, always engaging uh episode of, of of converse regarding the truth and, and the love of our lady and the this will bring us to our next segment where we'll, we'll begin uh the authentic marian dogmas are of our lady and we'll start of course with our lady as the mother of god so uh again uh so grateful for your invaluable insights both uh, of head and of heart and uh, as well your marological encyclopedic uh, dimensions of knowledge of what the church teaches about Our Lady. Well, thank you very much. We thank God for the church and thank God for the Blessed Mother, the Mother of the Church. Yeah, Amen. Thank you for your for your 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 great insights, Mark. God bless you. We praise God. Thank you. All right, and thanks for being with us uh, with uh, a master class in Mariology. More to come in our humble efforts to try to bring the the full truth about Our Lady and a proper love to her. Uh, through the internet uh, to the entire world for all those who want to know the whole truth about Mary, as St. John Paul II would say. Thanks for being with us. God bless you all.